Welcome to Aircrew Interview, I'm Mike from your host, and in this episode we chat with former F-100 and F-105 pilot Vic Viscara. In part one we chat about his time flying the F-100 Super Saber, which includes his training, what it was like to handle, and his time flying it over in Vietnam. Thank you and enjoy. So Vic, when did you first become interested in aviation? At a very early age, uh, I'd say that I got bitten by the flying bug at age five, uh, greatly influenced by my older brother. I was uh, one of four kids, the last, the youngest one, and uh, my oldest brother was 15 years older than I, uh, than myself, and um, he went off to the war, he, uh, World War II, fighter pilot, uh, started off in uh, Bell Air Cobra P-39s in North Africa, and then uh, transitioned into the uh, P-47, the Republic P-47, through Sicily in the Po Valley in Italy. So anyway, he left when I was about six years old. Plus, uh, I'd been separated from him uh, for a couple of years before that because my parents went back to the old country, Mexico. So I, uh, I was separated from uh, for quite a few years. So when he went off to the war, I vaguely knew him or remembered him, and my dad didn't want me to forget him. So he kept on saying, now, don't forget, you have another brother. And I say, well, where is he? And he says, he's over the other side of the world. Well, what's he doing there? Fighting the bad guys. Well, how's he fighting the bad guys? He flies an airplane. Ding! <laughs> the <laughs> light came on. I said, that's what I want to do. <laughs> and fortunately, uh, 20 years later, I'm flying the Republic F-105. So I was able to uh, achieve my dream. Awesome stuff. So yeah, what year did you actually join the Air and um, the US Air Force? And can you tell us some of the aircraft you started training on? Sure. Uh, well, I got my commission through the ROTC program, Reserve Officers Training uh, Corps, uh, in college. And when you graduate, uh, get your degree, you also get commissioned. So I was commissioned in uh, January of 1960. I graduated mid-year because I was in a four and a half year course uh, uh, mechanical engineering. Now it's four and a half years. So I graduated mid 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 year or mid term there in uh, January of uh, uh, 1960. Uh, got commissioned then, and uh, then get called up to active duty until March. So I reported for duty in in March. And uh, funny thing about it is, uh, in those days, uh, your flight training was divided into six months primary school and then six months basic training. And the first six months of the primary was actually conducted by civilian instructors at a civilian school. And that was mm. the way it was done in my days. So I went to through Spence Air Base in Moultrie, Georgia, a little town in, in the south there in Georgia. Uh, started off in a T-34 and uh, that was only a 30-hour program, and mainly, mainly the purpose of that program was to weed out the guys that didn't have a natural aptitude for flight, rather than have them wash, wash out six months later after they've already invested some money on them. So short program, 30 uh, hours. Uh, then from there, you graduated to the T-37, which was brand new. And uh, in fact, I was in the second uh, T-37 class. Uh, it replaced the uh, uh, North American T-28, the old th reship, and the last T-28 was still going through Spence at the time, and I was in the second T-37 class. Hmm. So I went from there, uh, graduated from there, uh, then uh, off to Lubbock, Texas uh, for basic training in the T-33, another six months. and. Finished that up in uh, May of 1961. That's when I got my wings. And in those days, uh, things have changed a lot because I'm ancient, you know. <laughs> I'm 84 you know. <laughs> years old. So, <laughs> so things have really changed. So then from there, off to Luke Air Force Base to six months uh, F-100 training. Uh, graduated from there. Then he went uh, four months to Nellis Air Force Base for advanced F-100. Uh, at Luke, you got everything, and I'd like, I need to back up a little bit. This was also, in, in the 60s, we were kind of approaching the tail end of the Cold War situation where uh, 
nuclear deterrence was the big thing. And so, like, when I went through uh, the six months training at uh, Luke, I would estimate that 80% of the flights and training was a nuclear with nuclear weapons and only 20% conventional, you know. Here we are four years later, we're in the Vietnam and Vietnam, no nukes and all conventional, and you've already done anything. Absolutely, yeah. And then when you graduated from there, you went to Nellis Air Force Base for advanced F-100 training, and that's where you got your mid-air refueling training, and you shot, or you did your air to air. You got to shoot on the on the dart, and uh, uh, and from there, uh, again, very fortunate. I was in a very small class. There were five of us, and when we graduated from there, there was five assignments, five guys, and when you believe it, we lucked out. Not a single person uh, wanted somebody else uh, assignment. Five guys, five assignments. We all got to pick exactly what we wanted. Wow. But <laughs> here's the funny thing. So I wanted George Air Force Base, which is in Victorville, uh, California. Uh, that's about 100 miles uh, north of Los Angeles, where I was from. So I wanted to be near home. So I selected uh, uh, George Air Force Base. And I still had one more flight to complete. Uh, to graduate, and that was a cross country. So I went off. I'm like, oh, oh. So we picked our assignments, got George exactly. I'm happily happy as a clam. <laughs> went off to uh, cross uh, cross country uh, to finish up. And when I came back, there's my wife standing on the other side of a flight line fence. She seldom came out to meet me <laughs> like that. So I thought to myself, hmm, something's up. Yeah. So I walked over and I said. Everything okay? And she says, oh, yeah, okay. She says, but our assignment's been changed. And I said, oh, really? What? Instead of George Air Force Base, 100 miles from home, I got posted to Homestead Air Force Base, Florida, Whoa. close to 3,000 miles away from home. <laughs> that, that was the bad news. The good news was, but the thing is, so anyway, my order said, report directly to Homestead. So I got to Homestead before the whole move, uh, the whole wing from George moved to Homestead. So I walk into uh, uh, the housing referral and I said, is there a list of uh, off-base housing referral? And the uh, airman behind the counter looked at me real strange, says, do you don't want to live on base? Well, here I thought, I'm only a second lieutenant. How am I going to qualify for uh, base housing there? And uh, he says, how many kids do you have? And I says, two. And he gets his little book out, hands me two keys. He says, here's two houses you can look at. Go look, look at it, the house and pick the one you want. Mm. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so so I went there, picked that. So my very first assignment, there I am, a second lieutenant, and I'm on base housing. A couple of weeks later, the wing shows up with all these guys. There's majors now. It, the ba uh, base housing got filled up just like that. Now there's majors. Having to go live off base. There oh, I am, no. sick on base. <laughs> so you looked out there. Yeah. yeah so. Awesome. So let's talk about the one, uh, the F one hundred. So, what were your first thoughts of the aircraft when you f f first saw it up close and personal? Well, I'll tell you. Funny things. I had the same thoughts both with the one hundred and the one hundred five. Uh, when you checked out on a new airplane, you had a requirement. You had to go. Uh, get what they call seven hours of cockpit time. Not all the time. You could, you could break it up to th different sections, yeah. but you had to total seven hours where you just sit in the cockpit and you look at every switch, every gauge, and you, and you have to be able to touch it, uh, blindfold it, the whole exact, so you would really get to know the airplane. Well, when I climbed up that ladder and climbed in the 100, I'll never forget my first thoughts. I look at it, I go, wow. This is big. I wonder if I can handle this. <laughs> <laughs> and 16 months later, I'm doing the same thing with the 105. And, oh, yeah. and that's even bigger than the 100. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, what was the aircraft like to fly? Like, how did she handle? Well, uh, surprisingly, you know, uh, the 100 was a tricky airplane to fly because of the characteristic of adverse yaw. Uh, it became strictly a rudder airplane. You didn't dare use the ailerons uh, when you got down to 200 knots or lower. It became strictly a rudder airplane. You didn't dare use 
ailerons. If you did, uh, it would start turning the direction you put in the ailerons to turn into, and then adverse jaw would grab that thing. And if you persisted on holding that, uh, that aileron in that position, the airplane would actually start turning the opposite direction All and right. flip over. And um, the cure for that thing was in training that let you, they say, hey, if that version starts getting you, best thing to do is just let go of the stick and you let go of it quick enough, it'll recover by itself and you won't have any problems. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, well, quick, quick, quick story about this. Yeah. Is, uh, so now I'm in the squadron. I'm a new guy in the squadron. And again, like I say, things change so much drastically. When I went to my squadron, my first operational squadron, all the old heads did not share their trade secrets of success of how, how to get behind some guy real quick at six o'clock. You'd go up there and do ACM, uh, air combat maneuvering, and they'd hang, hand you your rear end on a platter. You'd, you'd come back down on the, on, on the uh, ground and start debriefing, and, and you'd ask them, you'd say, hey, how did you get behind me so quickly? Oh, don't worry. With a little, little uh, experience, you'll get the hang of it. That was their stock answer, mm. which you know that didn't help you get. You yeah. had to uh, learn pretty quick. So anyway, I, so I'm up in a flight uh, with uh, an old head, and there he is, camped at by six o'clock. But he's slightly more like at six thirty. He wasn't directly behind me. He's off the side, and I'm thinking, you know, if I just pull a little harder, I may be able to spit him out. So I pulled a little harder. Well, I didn't realize I had a little bit, little bit of aileron in there. And next thing you know, that airplane just whipped up over. Yeah. So I did exactly what they said to do, let go of the stick. So I let go of the stick, hoping it would recover. Well, it recovered all right, but what it did, it did three tumbles, <laughs> tail over nose, three tumbles. <laughs> and when it came up, when, when it recovered, and it spit the guy. It, it slowed down, lost so much speed there. It spit the guy out in front of me, the old head out in front of me. <laughs> so I remember, oh, there. So I key the mic button. I go, -ta 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 -ta. smile, you're on camera. <laughs> Brilliant. What a story. <laughs> so we key back and landed. And, uh, and the next thing I know, the guy's up on my ladder. I, I haven't even climbed out of the uh, cockpit. He's on my ladder. He says, how'd you do that? What'd you, what'd you do? And I said, don't worry about it. With a little experience, you'll, you'll get the hang of it. <laughs> he gave him back his line. <clears throat> you know, and that, to show you how much that stuck in his mind, I came across that guy a couple years later after when I checked out in the 105, and now I'm over in Japan. And uh, <clears throat> I walk into the bar at the Oscars Club, and there's old Don Castleman, the guy that, that I had had that experience with. And I said, Don, what are you doing here? He says, oh, he says, I got a remote or something here in Japan. He says, it's so remote, they don't even have a, <clears throat> a clinic there. I have to come here uh, for my annual physical. And I said, hey, great. And I says, how long you'll be here? And I was like, anyway, make a long story short, I, I got him a ride in a F-105. And I put him in the back seat, and I took him up for a ride. And we're flying along, and he says, hey, Vic. He says, you remember that flight where you spit me out in front of the 100? And I go, yeah. He says, how the heck did you do that? And when I told him what I did, what had happened, I, I said, I said, Don, you won't believe it. He says, uh, I've got into adverse jaw. I lost control of the airplane. My eyes got this big as I tumbled through it. And when I recovered, you're out in front. And he goes, damn, he says, I should have known. I should have known. He says, I've never seen a F-100 stop that, uh, that fast in mid-flight. So, uh, <laughs> so I really had made an impression on him. <laughs> it sounds like he was like, uh, you know, when you try and figure out a magic trick for years and you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it sounds like, it's like <laughs> Exactly. <that. laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, um, obviously, the the 100, um, was it both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground? And what was what squadron were you with and what was the role of the 100 for you? Uh, okay. Uh, so, my first squadron... Uh, in the 100 Air Reporter, and this is my first operational squadron in my Air Force career, was the 309th TAC Fighter Squadron uh, of the 31st TAC Fighter Wing. So, getting that squadron, uh, and its primary duty was, uh, again, it was the tail end of the Cold War, and so our prim primary mission was nuclear deterrence. We would go 
deploy to the perimeter of the Soviet Union, you know, over to Turkey, uh, different allied bases there, and we set nuclear alert. And uh, so my first deployment was to uh, Okinawa, Kadena Air Force Base, uh, or Air Base at Okinawa. Uh, we were there to assume the nuclear alert, alert posture while it, the, the pilots that were permanently assigned there were back in the States checking out in the 105. You know, the 105 was starting to replace the 100 at the time. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, uh, one of my first uh, assignments was to uh, there. And uh, and like I say, that was our primary base. So when we're stationed at home, we'd go out to the range and uh, we'd carry a Su-21, which is a white uh, container with doors, and you could fit six small practice bombs in there. And you had uh, uh, BDU-33s, which were would mimic a standard conventional bomb. And then we had uh, uh, BDU-106s, which was a blunt nose practice bomb. Uh, and that blunt nose gave it the flight characteristics of a nuke, uh, a retarded nuke, uh, a, a nuclear weapon yeah. with a re, uh, re retardation uh, shoot that would lob it in there and like that. So, uh, so you'd go out to the range uh, and, and stay. Uh, your uh, duty was to stay proficient. Uh, another story I can tell. You, and by the way, if I'm telling, if I'm sidetracking you with too many of my stories, no, uh, all of it. <laughs> my wife says uh, I'm the only guy she knows that. Uh, can't tell a short story. <laughs> <laughs> no, go for so, it, Vic. I'm loving it. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, uh, so there I am. I'm a brand new guy in my first operational base, and had been. I think I've been there only something like three weeks, and I had to take a standard eval, standardization evaluation check ride, and uh, so I briefed the mission, and I. Looking at my watch, making sure to give myself time so I'm not rushed. So we go out to the aircraft and uh, <clears throat> do the pre flight, and it's a two seated uh, 105, uh, one of, uh, I mean, uh, 100, uh, 100F. So I'm in the front seat, and the back seat is the stand valve officer that's going to give you a check ride. So, so I wouldn't be rushed. I gave myself plenty of time so that when I finish my walk around, uh, it's too early to get in the cockpit. So the standing builder says, hey, I'm going to step uh, 50 feet away from here and have a smoke. You know, in, that, in those days, everybody smoked. Yeah. Uh, so so we, I said, okay. So we went back. So there we are sitting on the ramp, and I'm doing the flight through my mind, trying to make sure I do everything right. And I'm looking at, at the airplane and look at my watch, and it's just about time to step and climb in and start. All of a sudden, I realized I had not set the gyros there, there's a, uh, there was a panel right behind the cockpit that uh, you had to open up, and in there were the gyros. You would set the setting uh, for um, lab maneuver, a, uh, where you do the pitch up and, and lab uh, toss the the bomb up and down, and and uh, you do a little bit at the other end and escape the yeah. atomic blast headed the other way. I hadn't set. At the last minute, I realized I'd forgotten to set the gyro. So, man, I quickly oh. ran up there. And, and, and that gyro was so far back there, you, you, in those days, you could tell who the 100 pods were. You would carry a little dentist mirror <laughs> in, your, in your pencil pocket uh, uh, on your sleeve. Or your, or your, uh, so if you walk around the base and you saw all these guys with these mirrors <laughs> in your pocket, away. <laughs> you, you knew who, what they were flying. So there I am, and I'm sitting in the gyros and all that, and saved that. So got up there, went and flew the mission, did okay, and uh, and, and we're debriefing, and and all you know, uh, the flight examiner says, "Boy, Vic," he says, "I was sweating when we we're sit sitting there on the ramp, and I'm thinking you didn't set the gyros." And he says, "I'm sure <laughs> glad you remembered because I would have had to bust you. I would have to give you a pink slip and bust you wow. if." Uh, if you hadn't, uh, and so uh, that was the debriefing. That afternoon, he calls me, be, calls me back up. He says, Vic, he says, I've never seen this happen. He says, you know, on, on your flight, you almost forgot to set the gyros. That's the first time I've ever seen that happen in 
all my years of being a flight examiner. He says, so you almost forgot this afternoon, so-and-so flew and bombed, uh, did his nuclear bomb using your jaw thread. He's big as he totally forgot too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, you also, you know, this was your first two on the 100, but then you got, well, I suppose you volunteered to uh, do a tour on the 100 in Vietnam. Can you tell us about this? Well, okay, what, what happened is to get a combat tour in Vietnam, uh, you had to fly 100 uh, combat missions over the north. If you're flying missions up over North Vietnam, it required 100 missions to get a combat tour. Wow. Well, I did all my combat missions uh, on temporary duty from Japan. I was stationed in Japan flying the 105, and they would uh, set us down to the war two months at a time, I did three two-month tours, and then my uh, DROS, my data return from overseas, came up, and so I had to go back to the States. Well, in those three uh, temporary duty assignments to the war out of Japan, I had only accumulated 59 missions. Mm -hmm. So I was 41 missions short of a combat tour. So after we were back in the States, I told the wife, I said, I know you're not going to like this, but it says, I really feel like I need to volunteer to go back and finish ship so I can have my combat tour. Otherwise, they're going to come and pluck me up and send me there, and I'd rather go with my own choosing and all that. So uh, she says, yeah, you're right. I don't like that idea. And, and you know, the little woman, they're, they're always right. They, they know better. Very so she says, she says, here's what you should do. <laughs> so she suggested... The guys I hung around with, and at this time, I'm stationed at Edwards Air Force Base. And uh, uh, she, she, she suggested most of the guys I was hanging around with at that time had enrolled in the master's program on base to the seminar program. So she says, you ought to go get your master's and then volunteer to go back. And he says, and by getting your, by getting your master's, that will at least give us at least another year together uh, before you have to go back off to the war. So I said, yeah, you're right. So that's what I did. So after when I saw light at the end of the tunnel, I'm about to graduate, I put in a volunteer statement to go back to the war. And I said, I'm currently enrolled in this uh, master's program. I will graduate, finish and graduate at Sunset State. And I'm a volunteer to go back to Southeast Asia in these aircraft, and I, I made a big mistake. I listed seven different airplanes to go back into, and I, I was pretty sure they're going to send me back in the 105 anyway, because I was my high time fighter, most experienced fighter, my most recent fighter. Uh, but no, instead, I get a 100 assignment, which was total surprise. I mean, I, you know, it was on my list of airplanes, but it was way down the list, and uh, so that's how I ended up going back uh, in the 100. So went back and did a combat tour uh, in the 100 and um, saw a different part of the war. Uh, let me tell you, flying missions up north over North Vietnam versus flying missions over South Vietnam is different as night and day. Wow. Uh, the, the missions up north uh, were uh, uh, like uh, the old joke, uh, uh, hours and hours of stark uh, boredom interrupted by 10 minutes of stock uh, start yeah. uh, terror you know yeah yeah so uh, uh much ever uh flying combat over uh, south vietnam those missions were so easy and so benign compared to up north that uh, um, i could say it was enjoyable, <laughs> you enjoyable know yeah. Enjoyable. so yeah, yeah was the yeah. was the 100 um the right aircraft for that uh, theater in south vietnam for, for South Vietnam, it was, I, I thought it was a perfect aircraft because most of our missions were in support of the ground troops, uh, you know, close air support. Uh, the majority, those are the majority of the, of the missions. So it was the perfect airplane for the South. And <clears throat> I don't think I would have liked to have uh, flown 100 missions uh, over the North in the 100. Uh, uh, there's an old axiom in the air, in flying, speed is life. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, that, that's why I liked about the 105 is it was fast. So it was the right airplane for the north. 
while the 100 would have been too slow. I, 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 right choice. 100s in South Vietnam, 105s up north. Perfect. So, um, yeah, you said you got about 100 <laughs> missions there, but uh, can you share maybe a memorable story from your time in Vietnam on the 100? We also used to sit uh, alert at, at uh, in the 100 in Vietnam, and um, we were sitting alert to be launched in case uh, some ground troops would need uh, assistance or support. And sure enough, one time when I'm uh, sitting alert, um, we got launched, and of course, uh, inbound to the target, I made contact with the air to air fact. And uh, <clears throat> so he's given me a description of the target, and he said, Okay, there's a river that's running east west, and he said, Uh, the, the friendlies are on this side of the river, the bad guys are across the river, this side much larger force than the good guys, they need support. Mm -hmm. So we hit it. So he's giving me the description, everything's fine. And as I get near where he's describing, I said, hey, uh, the jungle is so thick there, uh, I can barely see the river. I said, uh, he says, no problem. He said, uh, I'm going to have the good guys pop some smoke. And he says, and your, your target's going to be about 100 yards north of the smoke. Mm -hmm. And it, <clears throat> and uh uh, so he, he said, they're going to pop uh, some blue smoke. Next thing I know, I see this smoke coming out of the jungle, but it's not blue, it's white. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, I got smoke, but it is not, it's not blue, it's uh, white. He, and the guy got, the, the uh, fat guy, Alex, I just, it's them, it's, it's the bad guys. They're, they're, they must be on frequency and they're spoofing us. He says, wow. hit the white smoke. And I that made me so nervous. Oh, God, because, yeah. Because here, he says, the good guy's got to pop smoke, and here's the smoke coming. So I said, okay, I said, please verify that you want me to hit that white smoke. <laughs> and he goes, Roger, man, he's excited. He says, go get him, go get him. He says, that's the bad guy, that's the bad guys. And I said, Roger that. Man, I felt so uncomfortable because oh, yeah. the thing I wanted to avoid was friendly fire, you know. Yeah, yeah. So... So I went in there and we uh, dropped on the white smoke and and he gave us a good uh, coverage, uh, BDA coverage and all that. Went back and never heard from it. So I guess I guess he was right. Yeah, he and must then, have been right. Uh, yeah, but my heart, uh, if that was me, my heart would have been going. Yeah, no, that's, so that's probably one of my most memorable missions uh, for within the 100. Yeah. So yeah, just um, quickly, what would um, munitions would the 100 be carrying in this theater? <clears throat> okay, uh, we carried uh, uh, 750 pound bombs. Uh, <clears throat> we would carry uh, on a tour uh, a rack, which was a uh, you had three stations, so you could we could carry three on each wing on a tour, uh, and so we'd carry 750 pound bombs, or we'd carry napalm, and then of course we did a lot of strafing also with the uh, cannon, the fort. Uh, 20 millimeter cannons. And was the cannon quite accurate? Uh, yes. Uh, you, you, uh, well, the X, it, it had good, accurate capability. It depended on the pilot how good he was, too. You know? <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it sounds like, yeah, you had a great time on the 100. So, yeah, how many hours did you get on the jet? Uh, I ended up with uh, uh, 660 hours in, in the uh, 100. Uh, my high time fighter was the 105, which was my favorite fighter. Uh, then uh, uh, about 700 hours in the F5, instructing in the F5, and 660 in the uh, 100, uh, and 120 in the F4. So uh, the 100 was my third high time uh, fighter. Uh, I, I enjoyed flying the 100. What, what about what I liked about uh, my experience with 100 is that, uh, like I mentioned, the 100 was a very tricky uh, airplane to fly. Uh, it, it had the highest accident rate mm -hmm. uh, of tactical air command, 38% losses uh, in accidents. So it was a tricky airplane to fly correctly. But once you mastered it, if you mastered the 100, you could fly anything. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant.